So my talk is about advanced software testing for data scientists. Advanced is always something subjective. Um, so we're definitely going to go beyond uh, writing a simple unit test. Okay, so we're going to look at beyond that. I'll give a, a quick overview still and a refresher, but we'll look at what's the journey after that. Okay, so quick raise of hand. Who, who likes Python in this room? <laughs> wow. Well, you're in the right conference then, so that's a good start. Um, this tutorial is actually suitable for both developers and data scientists. So who considers themselves more of a developer? Oh, cool. Sweet. What programming language do you use mostly? Uh, Python, C-sharp. OK, cool. Awesome. And who considers itself more of a data scientist? All right. Amazing. Well, you're in the right place as well. Uh, so that's good news. So my name is Raul. Um, only my mom calls me Raul Gabriel, uh, so Raul is fine, and I'm from Cambridge Park. So what we're going to cover in this tutorial um, is a, a few questions that uh, hopefully we'll get some answers by the end of this tutorial. So one is, uh, is my code correct? And the challenge is actually uh, more difficult when you're a data scientist because you write a lot of uh, code related to modeling and feature engineering, so how do we know whether it's doing the right thing? Um, then, you know, obviously, uh, writing tests is going to be a way to find out if we're doing the right thing. I'm going to define what being right means. Uh, but how do you write good tests? So there's guidelines and practices to, to write tests that are maintainable and uh, understandable. And um, we're also going to look at how do we generate a test. So I'm just going to quit this calendar so it doesn't jump up and down. Uh, so, you know, writing tests might feel like it's boring, it's taking a lot of time. So it wouldn't be nice if it was done for us, right? So, you know, wouldn't be nice if code was written for us, but that's another topic. Uh, and finally, how do we deal with system dependencies? Because in the real life, you know, you deal with uh, a number of cloud services, a number of REST API and endpoints, different databases, and those might all impact the code that you write. Uh, so that's also really important. So let's take a look at the uh, outline. So I'm gonna motivate what testing for data science uh, means the challenges around testing for data science. It turns out it's, I believe it's a lot more complex than uh, traditional software development. Um, so that's going to be really fascinating. Then we'll review the testing tools available in Python. Uh, you might be uh, already familiar with some of them. Maybe some are going to be new. We'll talk about unit testing, the principles. We'll look at parameterized tests, assertions available when you deal with pandas and NumPy, how do you write good tests. Then, we're gonna go on an epic journey. We're gonna take the buzzword compliant bandwagon, property-based testing. So that's gonna make everyone sound really smart at a fancy dinner party. We all love that. Um, so next time you sit with your managers, like, hey, property-based testing, super cool. Uh, so it comes with a caveat. Um, I, I believe it can be useful in certain scenarios. In some scenarios, actually, um, uh, maybe uh, overrated. So that's my take on it. So we'll, we'll take a look at what it means. And then we'll talk about uh, test doubles and mocking. So uh, getting rid of system dependencies. So this is my slide where you have the setup. Hopefully, hopefully, hopefully everybody did it before coming here. Uh, it is in the abstract of my tutorial. There's requirements and the repository. So take a photo if you haven't done it. Um, or go to my uh, tutorial description. You'll find it there. So what you'll see here is a, a Git repository with all the code samples I'm going to go through uh, and all the exercises. So don't worry if you miss out on stuff now. You'll have it all over there. There is a requirements.txt, uh, which you can use to create a uh, Conda environment that's going to be isolated with everything you need. OK? So I'm going to move on. Uh, in this tutorial, there's a lot of content. So um, going to show you a lot of demos, there's some exercises, I'll go over solutions and whatnot. But um, I'm going to move along fairly quickly, OK? So it's important that you stay focused for the next hour or so. Um, OK, cool. So let me give you some context. So I'm going to assume that you know, you've already developed a model, right? You've got some code. And now it's time to figure out how do we test it all, OK? So I'm going to use a data set from a Kickstarter. So let me dive in straight in the repository. So you'll see a bunch of files and folders. 
uh, in the project I'm providing uh, to you guys. Uh, there is a notebook uh, right here called uh, tutorial.ipainb, uh, okay? So that's what I'm gonna be uh, loading up now. Here we go. So there is a data set which is gonna be your train set. Um, and again, that's Kickstarter data. Anyone familiar with Kickstarter? Do you want to describe what Kickstarter is? Uh, yeah, it's like people have an idea and they raise their crowd money to get it started, um, but you're not investing in it. You're just basically, a lot of people use it for pre-ordering, like comics. Do it. Amazing, exactly. And there is typically a, a goal that you want to reach on how much money uh, you collect before the project goes ahead. So here, we're going to build a model that's going to predict whether a campaign will be successful or not. Okay? So it's a binary task. And uh, there might be different features of interest here, you know, the deadline, how many days there are to collect the, the money, uh, the description of the text, you know, that might all influence whether uh, the campaign will be successful or not, okay? <laughs> so let me show you a little bit what the, the data looks like. Um, this is real uh, messy uh, data, right? There's multiple columns. Uh, you'll see that we have some uh, NANs, we love NANs, right? Uh, there is uh, nested data, right? So some columns have JSON data, which have different keys, different values, and you know, here I can see there's some uh, uh, nested JSON as well. So we're gonna have to deal with all of that, right? So this is the real stuff. It's not a, an iris data set, okay? <laughs> this is like, how do we write real code for a data set that is messy and nested? So that's the context. Now, uh, I went a step ahead and I've already uh, uh, implemented a, uh, a model which is available in a file called model.py in the source folder. What I've got going on here is PyCharm. It's uh, my preferred IDE when I code in Python. You can use whatever you fancy. So what you'll see here is um, the way I structure the code, it makes use of the uh, pipeline and transformers API in scikit-learn. So that allows me to modularize my code, have different reusable components responsible for feature extraction and transformation. If you're not familiar with the scikit-learn pipeline and transformer API, that's okay. Don't worry about it. I strongly encourage you to learn more about it. And you'll see there's other PyData tutorial that covers uh, this topic. But essentially allows you to write code that is more maintainable and composable, okay? So here, uh, I've got a pipeline that I'm setting up, uh, it's gonna do some sort of feature engineering, apply uh, one-hot encoding on it. So just to give you a flavor, so this category extractor here, uh, this is another piece of code I've written. And what you'll see, you know, it's gonna try and figure out what are the different categories associated to a crowdfunding campaign, okay? So uh, we've got some piece of code here, it returns a pandas data frame. I'm gonna have another transformer here um, that, as you'll see here, is gonna do some sort of currency conversion. So different campaigns might be raising money, you know, in different currencies, so Canada, Europe, US, UK. So this is trying to normalize uh, the amount value to USD, okay? So those are all different transformation and stuff that you'd be doing as a data scientist. So all the code is already written, and as you can see, you know, there's multiple lines of code here. How do we know whether it's doing the right thing? My model is making use of all those different transformers, composing them together, et cetera, and then, you know, uh, training the model is the simplest task at that point, right? So here, let's just YOLO, logistic regression, and we're happy, okay? So the, the real art is in the feature engineering space, right? And that's where you can use your domain expertise and figure out what is gonna be relevant and impactful for the overall performance of the model. So, how do we test it all? How do we get confidence that uh, this is doing the right thing? That's the first question that comes to mind. And that's what I'll be covering in this tutorial and we'll learn different techniques uh, to work with that. Excellent. So, testing for data science. So the first question is, uh, what is it that we actually are testing? Because there's so many different things that you know, are worthwhile testing. 
So first of all, there is the uh, difference between the functional requirements and the non-functional requirements. So what I mean by functional requirement is, uh, is my model uh, it's putting a prediction in a, a range that we expect. You know, if it's a, a yes or a no, is it true or false, then it should be, you know, those two values, nothing else, right? So that's a functional requirement. Does it do the right thing? Is it correct as part of the specification? Um, is the pre-processing and the passing logic correct? So if we've got some sort of JSON object, we're extracting a field and we're converting that field to USD, is the conversion formula correct, right? So this is input to output. So that's what I mean by uh, functional requirement. We've written some business logic. We want to test that the business logic matches the specification. But that's not the only thing, right? Actually, the space for non-functional requirements is a lot richer. So um, as a data scientist, obviously, you know, we, we, we love working a Jupyter notebook and so on. But then it's like, well, how do we productionize our work? Right, so at some point, we go from a notebook to a series of files and classes, it gets packaged up, and then deployed perhaps as a REST service, right? Which, you know, a different team could, could utilize. So I raise this question on, you know, is the model able to handle a different request, right? So how many requests per second can it handle? Do we have a sort of SLA in terms of the latency of the prediction? You know, so let's say classic example of fraud detection, Latency at this point is really important. So you don't want to be waiting several hours or even several seconds, right? You want to have milliseconds. And that's really important because different models might have a, a higher complexity, might be slower in comparison to simpler models that are faster, right? So those are all non-functional uh, requirements. Now there's also the question of uh, mod model performance. If we push an update to a model, how do we know whether there's a performance improvement in terms of different metrics that we might be deciding on. So we need to keep track of which uh, training data set we trained the model with, which test data set we trained on, what was the history, and did we actually get an improvement? Right? So that's also um, important. Now today, people also talk about uh, explainability of a model. How can you justify that a certain decision is made? Can you explain it in layman terms to maybe uh, a business person? So I consider that also part of the sort of a non-functional requirements, right? You might have to provide a good justification that this model is simple to explain. But that's not functional requirements. We don't really have a, an input and output that we can match based on a specification. Those are other requirements. And uh, I read this paper from uh, Booking.com, um, which has a really fancy catchy name, 150 successful machine learning models, six lessons learned, right? And uh, those guys um, also talk about non-functional requirements. So they say uh, prediction uh, serving latency is really important uh, for a model. So what they found out is if they had like a 30% uh, increase in latency, so that means there's a slowdown, right? That had a direct impact on a conversion rates for the booking, right? So I think it's like 0.5%. But 0.5% when you, you know, scale at, at a massive scale, it's a lot of money, right? So latency is a massive concern. So as a data scientist, perhaps that's something we need to keep in mind when we productionize our work and work together with data engineers and developers. The other one is, um, it's great to test the performance of your model in the evaluation step, which is kind of like the notebook. But what happens afterwards? when it's deployed. How do we know whether the model is still behaving as we expect, now that we have inputs that we've never seen before, right? So the idea of actually doing some sort of response distribution analysis, so if we look at the distributions of the output, are those in line with what we'd expect the model to be or not, right? So the story continues after the notebook. Um, and finally, I, th I thought one of the most interesting point was that model performance is not the same as business performance, right? So what that means is, you know, pushing to get 99% accuracy doesn't necessarily mean that we get business value or a useful business outcome out of it. It might be that at some point, at some threshold, you plateau in terms of the business outcome that you can get out of this piece of work, right? So um, those are all discussions that are actually happening beyond is my code uh, correct, okay? Uh, so really encourage you to read uh, this paper.
Now, in my tutorial, we're going to focus on functional requirements. Okay, so we've written some code. We want to get confidence that the code is uh, matching the specification. Okay, so that's context. Super. So, why are we testing? Does this look familiar to you? Pretty much a standard Monday morning in Manhattan. You know, I was taking a, an Uber on Monday morning, instantly regretted it, stuck in traffic. So I've experienced the New York subway for the first time in my life this week. That was pretty cool. Cool. So, um, you know, the point here is, um, in ideal scenario, you know, we want to have a, a smooth journey. We want to go to A to B really fast. There's nothing unexpected, right? That's kind of like, we don't want to be stressed out. This is stressful. So how can we write code that is not like that? And that's the point of uh, why are we testing? We want to be stress-free when things are deployed in production, okay? Now, unfortunately, um, the data science workflow is super complex. And I believe more so than software development. So in software development, let's say we implement a web application, you know, there is a finite set of concerns that you're worried about, right? You've got some sort of data storage, you've got a front end, and you might be having some business logic around it, right? That, that's the software development space when it comes to web development. Now, in data science, there's so many different things. So one is, you know, the business requirements, you know, and so you have to engage your stakeholders, and then you figure out, well, we're gonna need some data to accomplish the goals and the requirements. So what data is it? Where is it stored? And what data formats? So today we deal with JSON, CSV, Parquet, different binary formats. So we need to learn it all, right? And they all have different trade-offs and they all might be useful in different contexts, depending on querying efficiency, depending on the storage size. Okay, so that's just data formats. Then there's so many different database technologies, right? So you've got the, the SQL space, the NoSQL space. Within SQL, you might have like, document-oriented storage, you might have graph databases. Then you replicate the same thing if you want to scale in terms of petabytes or gigabytes and depending on the latency trade-offs that you want to have. So it's really complex, right? So that's just uh, the first uh, part, data collection. Now, you have different specialists here. You've got data engineers or even database specialists. Great. Now we have some data stored somewhere with some query language and so on. The next step is, well, we can't really use this data, right? It's raw data. We need to perhaps build some sort of data assets that are gonna be utilized by wider teams in the company. So we need to embark on a whole process of cleaning the data. So I see you smiling over there. So you're probably thinking, yeah, this is what's going on in my company right now. Great data assets, fancy buzzword. Great, so data cleaning. And again, there's different skill set here. You know, you might be using a, a SQL, right? To, to get the, the, the data, maybe clean it up there. You might then call pandas to the rescue because the SQL queries become really messy. You don't get it, right? So let's use pandas, maybe do some imputation, clean up the, the NANs, etc. Then, well, good, we've got some data assets and so on, but at the end of the day, we want to build a machine learning model. So if you don't have labels, if you don't know what is it you want to predict or something like that, then it's not gonna be useful. So yeah, there's another process on like, can we label the data? And maybe this is where you bring up stakeholders again, and they might have a fancy UI, right, to kind of label the data for you and whatnot. Cool, then you've got feature engineering, right? So yes, data scientists, cool. We've got some domain expertise, let's see what we can engineer. And then training is only one small aspect of all of this, right? So like, cool, scikit-learn, neural nets, YOLO, right, cool, get a nice model evaluate it, then like, well, it's not really great at this point, let's go back to feature engineering, iterate. Then you deploy it. So deployment might be that you package it up as a library for other people to use it, or it might be that you decide to have a REST service with an endpoint that software developers can utilize, right? So you've got separation of concerns amongst different teams. Then you have to monitor this whole thing. So it is like really complex. Now the bad news is that each of these components typically is maintained by different people with different skill sets, and the whole thing is to be tested, right? So where do we even start 
Uh, so things are, are tough, right? Now I'm gonna make it even more difficult. All of this, obviously, you have dependencies. You have dependencies on, you know, data, right? where is it, files, but web APIs. So web API uh, might be rate limited, so you can't use it anymore. Or there might be an incompatibilities in terms of the results. So that nice JSON object that is returned, the shape might change. So that's gonna impact your code as well. Uh, you might be dealing with databases. Database can be out of service. Uh, there might be a bottleneck. You might be relying on different cloud services, AWS, GCP, Azure, you name it, right? So on top of this complex workflow, you have external factors that are out of your control, right? But you need to keep that in consideration when you write the code and when you test it. Now, um, again, there's a really nice paper uh, which I was really impressed about because this is one of the most prestigious software engineering conference uh, in the world. And they talk about you know, machine learning for production. So this is software engineer. So strongly encourage you to, uh, to take a look at it. Here's the, the reference. Awesome. So what are the challenges? Well, we deal with many different data formats from CSV to Parquet to JSON and so on. Uh, we're going to have to work with external dependencies. We have black box models that, you know, we don't really understand how they operate, right? It's not like I can poke the state of the model to understand if it's doing the right thing or not. It just has some sort of prediction. And the predictions are also non-deterministic. So I might not get an accurate number. I always get this sort of weird floating point value that one day is slightly different than the other one. So how am I supposed to uh, have a predictable test in that context? Um, now we deal a lot with um, teams that have multiple skill set. So data scientist works with a data engineer that works with developers and a business person. So everyone needs to have a common vocabulary and common software development practice. So yeah, so that's the story. So testing for data science is a fascinating space. I don't think everyone has figured it out uh, yet, right? So what I'm going to do is tutorial is to describe a few techniques that are available in the software development uh, a world that uh, I believe are useful uh, for, for machine learning as well. So don't worry, this is fine. You know, uh, I just wanted to be completely honest with everybody here uh, about the, the difficulties. And now let's dive into uh, some uh, solutions. So why uh, uh, software testing? So by software testing, I mean automated software testing, right? You can still test something by clicking around and and seeing the results. Here we, we want to embark on an automated process. So perhaps uh, the most boring one is, um, you know, finding bugs, right? We'd like to find that something is not behaving as expected uh, so we can fix it. Uh, so users are not gonna be pissed off or the stakeholders are not gonna question things. So that's the, the first thing, right? So that's why we test. Now I think one that is even more important in the context of um, software development collaboration is removing the fear of changes. You know, you implement business logic for feature extraction and for modeling. Somebody else is gonna refactor your code or make uh, incremental updates. How do we know that this person or other teams have not introduced new bugs, right? So having an automated test suite that you can repeatedly run to catch regressions is a way to remove that fear, right, of making changes. Now the, the third one is enhancing the debugging process. If a test fails, you get a diagnostic on why did it fail, and that will guide you on finding out the, the root of the issue. And finally, it's really about increasing confidence before we move to production, because once it's in production, things are always more expensive to fix than on your local computer, right? Because at this point, it's public, other people use it, reputational damage, it's harder to make change something that is deployed because you have to interact with multiple people. So that's kind of like the ultimate reason on why software testing is, is so important. So let me review uh, the different tools available in, in Python, and then I'm gonna focus on one of them called PyTest. Anyone heard of dog test? Yeah, cool. Uh, completely useless, but it's cute. Right? So it's got its perks. Uh, so you can see that uh, we've got our favorite doc string here. So doc string is just a way to document what a function or method might be doing. 
inputs uh, and outputs. And then what you see here in bold in my slide with the a greater operator is an invocation of this uh, function and below the output. So doc test is a tool that will catch all those special uh, invocation, run the function with the input and then do a string match based on the output. Okay, so just a way to test that your documentation is correct. Does that make sense? Now, um, there's pros and cons. The pros are the learning curve is absolutely minimal, right? Anybody can say, this is the function, this is the output I expect, right? The syntax is really familiar. Now, the downside is um, there isn't a great uh, use case in the context of continuous integration. So continuous integration is the process where you make a change to your code, you push it, the server will run some tests and give you some feedback, okay? Now in practice, when you write real code, you're gonna have a pandas data frames, you're gonna have to write assertions that go beyond uh, a string equality check, right? You might deal with different data structures, you might deal with different properties, things are greater and smaller and so on. Um, you'll deal with databases that you might have to set up and tear down, so the system dependencies and so on. So writing real tests requires a lot of things that doc test doesn't provide. It just does a simple string equality check. Okay, so it's not suitable for the real world. Uh, so the only purpose is about validating documentation. Now you often see doc tests, you know, in like libraries that are really um, are known, where people have a doc string and quick examples that help you about like, you know, how do I use this, rather than is it doing the right thing. Next is unit test. So that's a, a package part of the standard library. Anyone use unit test? Okay, cool, cool. Um, so unit test, uh, is a package that is typically adopted, and maybe, let's see if the proof is in the pudding. Did you use unit test before? A little bit. Yeah, so in C-sharp, I believe there's like a similar uh, oh, yeah. API. Right, cool. Um, so unit test is designed around classes and methods, so it's designed with an object-oriented programming uh, approach. So that's why it's typically adopted by software developers, because this um, API has been around for several years, so people are already familiar with the classes and methods uh, as part of the unit test library. So not just in Python. Retention, please. Retention, please. This is building a fire in the middle of the So um, maybe I should go back to uh, this slide. Uh, <laughs> this is fine, this is fine. Stay tuned. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, let's go back to writing some tests maybe. Um, so yeah, so unit test is really popular from a software development uh, ecosystem because it takes this class as a method approach. Now there's downsides with that. So there's more boilerplate they have to write, you know, you have to declare a class, it's subclass, a test case, there's methods that you need to write. I'll show you some examples. Um, and there's limited diagnostics, so there's only a, a few assertions that you can use, uh, like, you know, assert equal, assert true, and this kind of stuff. Uh, you'll see that PyTest and other assertion library provide a much richer vocabulary. Now, uh, Marbles is like the, the new cool kid on the block. Uh, it's an extension for unit test. So it looks at um, uh, addressing uh, some of the issues that you need to test. Can I have your attention, please? Can I have your attention, please? This is the building fire and I think director. We have concluded our investigation into the alarm signal from the seller. We have discovered a system malfunction and it has been corrected. Please resume normal business activity. Thank you. Excellent. Should have written a unit test in a sandbox environment before pushing to production. Great. That's the main takeaway of my tutorial. I love it. Um, 
So mobiles. Uh, so mobiles and essentially enhances unit tests with better diagnostics, uh, provides you with information around the test failures, what are all the local variables, uh, and what the states are at the point of failure. So that's going to help you uh, in the debugging process. So we'll look in a demo in a moment. And then PyTest. Anyone used PyTest before? Right? So typically PyTest is the preferred uh, testing uh, tool in uh, Python by data scientists. Uh, the reason is, as a data scientist, you know, typically you might be coming from a more mathsy kind of background, so you're familiar with functions, writing simple functions with no boilerplate. That's the attraction point. There's enhanced diagnostics uh, in comparison to unit test. So there's one simple assertion called assert, but it's, uh, it's overloaded in a way that it will pick up different data structure, different types, and provide kind of custom diagnostics around it. It supports a parameterized test. So that's a way to decouple the test itself from the data that it uses, so the inputs and output. So that gives you more flexibility in terms of reusing the same test templates. So that is to code as more maintainable. It has also something called fixtures. So fixtures is, uh, actually parameterized test is an example of a fixture, but it's the idea of, for example, having a, a setup and a teardown process when you're making use of a database or when you're making use of a system dependency, right? So. Uh, PyTest provides all of that, and it's the preferred tool by uh, data scientists. So let's look at, um, uh, let's compare those uh, three different tools, so we all have kind of um, a good idea, and then we'll deep dive into um, uh, PyTest and other techniques. So what you'll see in the, um, in the folder, there's different files available in the test uh, directory. So let's start with unit test. Um, so here's an example of a, a test case. Uh, written using uh, the unit test standard uh, library, so it's imported. Uh, I've got a class, it's subclass, a test case. A test case will give me uh, special methods to write assertions, so those would be inherited. So I've got a test here that, given a pandas data frame and given my country transformer, let's uh, apply this transformer on the data frame and then I can write a series of assertions to see that uh, the result is as expected, okay? And I've got another unit test here. Um, so let me see if I can um, make this one fail. Yeah, cool. I'll, uh, I'll delete a few things, make some tests fail so we can see some, uh, some output. So I'm gonna run a unit test. It's called test country transformers and that unit test. Cool. Boom. So this is an example of an output that you'll see. So this specific test here, which is called test uh, unknown, an unknown country returns default. We see that uh, one of the assertion failed. So immediately you can see that the diagnostic is kind of limited. So I, I don't really have the source code around it, I've got a trace back of where the failure uh, happened. Okay, so that's unit test. Now let's look at running the same thing uh, using marbles. So the benefit of using marbles is there isn't much that you need to change, you just need to say marbles, and then we can run exactly the same thing. And what you'll see here, we've got some, uh, a bit of enhanced di diagnostics here, so we've got the l different lines of code that surround the test failure, we have all the local variables and the state that is part of the diagnostics, okay? So this is kind of like the two data frames that we use, so one is the sample and the other one is the result, okay? So that's, that's marbles. So it's quite a nice little friend uh, to add in if you're already using unit test. It retrofits immediately. You just change the module uh, on how the test actually executed, okay? Cool. Now uh, let's look at a pie test. So here's a, an example of the, the same sort of a uh, test, but written using PyTest. So as you can see, things are already more concise. You don't have to worry about classes and methods and so on. You just write uh, the simple functions, and the assertion is basically just one function called assert, which you can utilize to check whether things are correct or not. So let's uh, run that again in the command line to see what sort of output we get. So let's use PyTest. Boom, 
So what we can see here is that we've got one failed test, one that passed. The failing test is this one, and this is where things failed. You can see the code around it is provided. There's some nice little colors, that's cute. Um, so typically what PyTest would do, so this is a simple example, but let's say you had a function call available as part of the assertion. It would tell you this function call return this result and that's the thing that failed, right? So it kind of like try and be friendly with the error message. So let's, uh, let's fix this um, and see uh, what we get. So I had a nan and we expect other. So what I can quickly do here is for every uh, nan value, we'll replace it with uh, other. So that's if the country is not found in a default list. Now I can rerun my test and what we'll see is we get a nice green bar. Okay, so two tests passed. Yep. So that's a demo for PyTest. Cool. So let's deep dive a little bit into uh, PyTest and uh, other assertions available. Thumbs up so far, everybody? Cool. So I think the, the first question is, uh, how do you structure uh, a project when you've got source files, like feature extraction, your transformer, your pipelines, your model, and also a bunch of tests? Right. So uh, the good news is the software development community has been uh, structuring large uh, projects for a long time. And this is the uh, recommended uh, approach. So one is have a source folder where you have all your modules that uh, are going to be uh, reusable and that you implement, and a separate folder where you've got your test modules. So the benefit of this approach is when it comes down to packaging, all the files related to source available in one single directory. So it makes the packaging process and deployment really simple. Okay? And all your tests are available separately. That means that the uh, archive that is published is light to weight. Um, now, another approach that you often see in Python for simple projects is when the module, so for example, transformer.py and test transformer.py are available in the same directory. So the downside with that is that it makes the packaging process more difficult because you need to filter out which files do we select, which file do we not select, and wrap this stuff up. Now, the upside of that is when it comes to importing, things are really simple, right? Because the Python path will load the module that is available in the same directory. So when test transformers depends on transformers, if it's in the same directory, it's simple, it's there, right? So it's, it's reusable. So, um, what I recommend is split out the source and the test, and when it comes to wiring up the Python path, typically that's the script or configuration that you write that does it for you, okay? But the benefit here is this clear separation of uh, concerns. So there's uh, an exercise to do. Um, we're not gonna have time for everybody to code every exercise here, so what I'm gonna do is to introduce the exercise, show you the solution, but when you go home, you can do all the exercises in your own time and I'll publish the solution after the tutorial, okay? So uh, let's take a look together. So what you'll see, there's a folder called exercises. And uh, in this first exercise, what you need to do is to write some tests for our categories extractor. So the categories extractor is um, something that takes a JSON string and needs to extract categories out of this JSON string. Okay, so a JSON string will be structured like this. So you'll have uh, like a key called slug, and then you'll have a thing that would say uh, music, and then rock. Okay, so you're gonna have to write a test where given a JSON string, the categories music and rock are actually uh, returned. Okay, so there's a bit of parsing going on here. And I'll show you later on that it turns out this is actually uh, a much more, uh, sophisticated problem than it looks like. Um, and this is where hypotheses uh, will come handy, okay? So you'll need to use PyTest to do that. Um, now, let me walk you through solution, right? So it might look a little bit like this. So you, you provide a sample, you call the categories uh, extractor, and then you assert that the output is as you expect, okay? So that's gonna be the first exercise to do um, when you go back home. So let's uh, keep going. So the next topic I want to talk about is, uh, well, Raul, you know, in data science, we use those libraries that developers don't use. You know, we use pandas, we use NumPy, you know. Can we write tests when we have those kind of weird data structures? Well, I'm glad you asked the question, 
Because the answer is yes. So let's look at a let's look at a demo of where things uh, might go wrong. Um, so let's um, let's look at this example here. And we'll comment all of that. Okay. So uh, here's an example of a test um, that you know set some stuff up. A goal adjuster. So the goal adjuster is a transformer that will do the currency uh, conversion to USD, okay? And takes a pandas data frame, returns another pandas data frame. We'll transform it, and then we like to check that the result is as expected. So you might be tempted to write something like this, right? Is the result as we expect? Sounds good. So let's run this into PyTest and see the result we get. I don't know how you guys feel about this, but it doesn't look particularly uh, inviting uh, and uh, friend friendly. Uh, it looks a little scary. There's a lot of uh, value error stuff going on. So the, the error is this one. So it's basically saying, oh, wait a minute, you got a pandas data frame here in the context of a, a, a Boolean expression. W what does it mean for the pandas data frame? Do you think that all the elements are true? Or is the pandas data frame not empty? What is it? Right? So actually, it turns out what we want to do here is to do an exact equality check for all the elements and columns inside the pandas data frame. That's really what we want to assert on. Now, for this, there are uh, special uh, assertions available that are provided as part of the pandas uh, library that you can use if you want to do equality check on a data frame, an index, or a series. So let's, let me show you the difference now. So I'm going to use the uh, assert frame equal assertion. So that comes from pandas itself. Now we can rerun a test. The test passed. It's great. Now let's make it fail to see if we get any sort of good uh, diagnostic. So let's make that uh, three here. So my test is going to fail on purpose, just so you see the diagnostic that uh, this assertion will produce. So what you'll see here, a bit more friendly, right? So on the left side, we had a data frame with the number 30, then we had 20 on the right-hand side. So something has gone wrong here. So that's a lot more useful than uh, the ambiguous value error, okay? Cool. So if you're writing tests and using pandas, make sure that you incorporate the pandas uh, assertion suite. Cool. Next topic. We're going to talk about a parameterized test. Now, typically, when you write a test, you're going to check for multiple inputs and multiple outputs, right? Because there's different scenarios that you may be interested in testing, including edge cases. So typically, things like you know a zero, a negative number, and then expected values that are provided by stakeholders. But the template for the test is always the same. Now, you can copy-paste your test multiple times, change the inputs and outputs, which is great if you're paid by the number of lines of code that you write, right? See the lady there is like, yeah, absolutely. Uh, unfortunately, we don't live in that reality, right? Um, great, 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 good stuff. Um, but here we're gonna learn a new trick uh, that's gonna help us you know, write um, tests that are more maintainable. So what I mean by that is, decoupling the logic of the test versus the input and output that actually we're feeding into that test, okay? So um, let's look at um, an example. So this is written using a PyTest. So what you see here um, is an example of a parameterized uh, test. So here we're specifying a list of uh, inputs and outputs. So don't worry about the syntax just now. I'll kind of explain what's going on. So I've got a list, and uh, each element in the list is a tuple. The tuple constitutes of uh, an input and an expected output. Okay, so in this case, the input is a panda data frame, and the output is another pandas data frame. How many test cases do I have here? Three. Three. Excellent. So. What you can see here is that we clearly have a separation of concerns. We've got one part which is like setting up 
the inputs and expected values. And then the other part is actually what's the template for my unit test. So the way this works is using uh, this PyTest uh, feature called the parameterized test. And what that's going to do is to say, look, uh, we're taking this uh, list of test cases here. This is a description of the uh, input and output. Now my test gets this data injected. So that's done by PyTest. And the template itself essentially can utilize those arguments. But what's important is that for every run, PyTest will plug in each of the test cases available in that list. So let's uh, run that into the command line just to, to see what's going on. So how did I call this? Transformers parameterized. That's a cool name. Boom. So what you can see here, interestingly, is that it says three tests uh, passed, right, as opposed to one. And that's because you had three test cases. Now I can make, um, you know, let's just uh, make this one a fail so we see an example of what will happen, right? So in this case, we had uh, two tests that passed and one that failed because I just simply changed one of the input two to make it fail, okay? So a parameterized test uh, is a good, um, feature because it allows you to write tests that are more maintainable, you focus on the template, and when it comes to providing new inputs and outputs, you have a single place to do it, so it makes it really simple to add new edge cases and new requirements. I have a question on it. Just to make sure I understand the syntax, so basically that tuple can take any shape, so all the different variables, and then on that string, basically you just are passing like uh, variables into your test. Correct. And you, the test now is parameterized using that input and output, and then that's what gets fed in every time. Cool. Um, so there is another exercise, which is called test exercise two. And uh, in this exercise, you'll see that we have a time transformer. A time transformer uh, is one of the feature extractor uh, in this domain. So we deal with timestamps, so there's a deadline for the crowdfunding campaign, that's a timestamp. There's the creation of the campaign, there's when it's actually launched. So you might want to create features like how many days until the deadline or this kind of stuff, right? So that's what the transformer does. And you have to write some test to check that the logic is correct. And because there's multiple timestamps possible, you might be interested in using parameterized test, right? And an edge case would be, you know, a timestamp of zero, for example. What would it mean? So um, that's the other exercise. And, um, you know, like a solution would, would look like that. So you set up your test cases, again, a list of tuples, and then you provide a template that calls a time transformer with a sample data frame, and then an assertion here using the asset frame equals because we deal with pandas data frame, okay? Cool. So now that we've learned how to use a uh, PyTest, uh, we looked at uh, assertion specific for pandas, we looked at parameterized test. What does it mean to actually write a good test? So that's my, my, my next question. So there's a framework that you can adopt which allows you to simply structure uh, a unit test and it's called a given when then pattern. So it's not a design pattern or anything like that. It's just a, a way for you to write a test so that when somebody else looks at it, they immediately recognize the three different parts, right? So one part is the preconditions. So those are the inputs that you're gonna be using as part of your test. The second part is actually the behavior that we want to test, so that's called when. And the final part is the post conditions. What is it we want to verify? So those are the three parts, and you can make those parts explicit in your code. And the way that looks, it's a bit like that. So you make adequate use of spacing, to make it clear what the different parts are. So here I've got my given step. So I have a goal adjuster, different variables that I'm gonna be using, the behavior that I'm gonna test, and then different assertions, okay? So the objective here is to write tests that are more maintainable and readable by other people. Now another way to write good tests is by uh, trying to bridge the gap between the, the business domain and the code. 
So that's using a language that's closer to English or closer to what business uh, professional would be using. So for example, here, you see this code, I said B in A and C in A and len A equals equals two. That might be a bit uh, alien to someone that you know doesn't have uh, a technical background or a developer background. Now the second part here is written using a library called PyTruth and it's a bit closer to the domain, right? I saw that A contains exactly B and C. So we're writing declarative tests, essentially having a richer vocabulary to specify assertions that are closer to, the, to English. So um, PyTruth is um, an assertion lab library maintained by Google. Uh, here's different um, examples. So you might want to say that you know, a string starts with a prefix, or uh, it has a given length, so there's a nice method called has length. Uh, something is not zero, it contains all n rights, so this is the vocabulary uh, that you can use. So let's uh, uh, look into um, a little demo of how that looks like. So I'm jumping back to the notebook, which is available in the uh, notebooks folder. So PyTruth, so I'll uh, import the asset that uh, function. Then uh, I'm gonna look at um, one of the lines in my data set, right? So this is uh, one of the row. So you see we've got different columns. Each column has different values. And now I'm gonna specify some assertions on that. So the first thing I may wish to say is, well, is the deadline non-zero? What do we think the answer is? So I've got deadline here. And it's non zero, so I execute this line here in my notebook. You see, nothing happens because there wasn't any assertion failure. Now, I could check to see if it's zero, so I'll just write is zero. And if I run that, what you'll see is that we have an assertion error, and there's a nice diagnostic that is generated, so it's not true that the value is zero. Okay, so the benefit of Using a richer vocabulary for assertion is that you also get uh, enhanced diagnostics. Now I might wish to write another assertion here, so I said that the blurb contains uh, NYC, so let's check. So the blurb here, we'll see if NYC is contained. So I run this with an assertion error. And what does that say? So it says that original songs, so this is the text, should have contained NYC, but it's not the case, okay? Now maybe I can write um, songs. If I rerun that, nothing's gone wrong, so that's good. Okay. Cool. So the benefit of a uh, you know declarative test is if you work quite closely with uh, you know uh, the business team or different stakeholders, you can really get them involved in the process of writing the test with you then this is where this sort of library comes uh, handy on top of providing better diagnostics uh, than something like a assert. So how do you write good tests? Well, tests should be treated like normal code, right? At the end of the day, you write code, whether it's uh, code that is for a model, a feature engineering, it's just code. So let's adopt the same uh, good principles. So here's an example of a bad test. What is bad about it? I see the gentleman smiling at me saying, pretty sure Rao, you've copy pasted that from a code base. Yeah. Is that what happened here? <laughs> yeah, something like that. Something I, love, I love magic numbers. You love magic numbers? Yeah, yeah. so what does a five mean? Uh, what's one zero one? What's ten? No idea. No idea. I, I actually generally don't know. Uh, anything else? I'm not sure what you're testing. Yeah, what is it we're testing? We're test one. Huh? Test one. So this is so important, especially in the context of continuous integration, right? So git push, goes to your server, you get a log with problems. If this log tells you test one, where do I start, right? So that's not gonna be helpful. Anything else? Yeah? Yeah, I, yeah, X, yeah, what does X mean? Maybe we're modeling X man or something, I don't know. You're right, so X, not really useful variable naming, so 
The reason it's not useful is I don't have any uh, domain, business domain context. I have no idea what we're dealing with, right? So I have to think now. So we don't want to be thinking too much here. We want to know what's going on. Yeah? Anything else? You probably want the SRT equals or something. Is that? Ah, Bree set to one. Very good. So here we're using the unit test uh, library. So maybe we should use PyTest, right? But as a true, it's only going to tell you true or false. So I get a log, and it's going to say it's true or <laughs> false. It's not going to be handy, right? So here, the problem is we have a Boolean expression that is passed as an argument to this assertion. A better assertion would be assert equal, because assert equal will tell you the right-hand side and the left-hand side. And that might give you an indication of what the problem might be, you know, like an off-by-one error or something like that, right? Here, we're not going to get any indication. There's one last thing. So much bad stuff for just a couple of lines of code, right? Oh, interesting. Um, I haven't seen so much doc string written for unit tests. So typically, you have like a nice readable uh, name for your test. And so instead of test one, you know, uh, test prediction with a standard output is correct. You know, something like nice and verbose. So when you have a failure, the name of the test is available in your log, right? So the last one is um, you see this x dot r. So what we've done here is to uh, couple the test to an internal implementation detail, right? So R is a field. So if that field has to be renamed, or that field doesn't exist anymore, or it's going to be a different uh, data type, then your test is going to have to be changing as well. So typically, you want to test the interface level to decouple your test from internal implementation. So that's a more subtle one. So that's also bad. So here's an example of a, a better test. So we're not saving the characters that we write or anything like that. You know, it's nice and verbose. We clearly indicate what's going on. Uh, instead of magic numbers, you know, we've got a variable that provides domain context. Or we utilize named arguments, which is a Python a feature. So for example, here my constructor, I'm plugging in, they're actually reading with some weights. Uh, and then a better assertion mechanism. Okay. So that's kind of the recipe, and we also follow the given when then pattern. Awesome. So to summarize the testing best practices, so verbose naming is better, because you get a log. You want to know what the issue is. You want to test behavior, not implementation, because if you test implementation, you couple yourself to an implementation that might change. Uh, the magic number and pattern, don't repeat yourself. So more copy pasting means more maintenance depth. So you might want to look into parameterized test to avoid this. And finally, you know, assertions are your friend, right? The more assertions, the more declarative they are, then the better diagnostics ultimately you're gonna get when things go wrong. Okay? Cool. So something that goes hands in hands with uh, testing is test coverage. So test coverage is essentially um, a technique that will tell you which line of code were not executed when the tests were run. That's the only thing it does. Now, this is helpful to detect errors in your code, which perhaps you should pay attention to, right? So if the test is never executed in those lines of code, then how do you know if those lines of code are doing the right thing? So that's the intuition. So coverage allows you to detect those places and then uh, you can decide whether you should actually write more tests to make sure you cover those paths that you haven't thought about. Now, this comes with a caveat. Um, aiming for 100% coverage doesn't mean that your code is correct. It just means that the lines of code were executed uh, as part of the test suite. But if you have different edge cases, then that might not be uh, unraveled in, in the coverage. Okay, So that comes with uh, this caveat. So I'm going to show you a demo of the output that you can expect. So there's a tool called PyTest Cov that is essentially uh, goes hands in hands with PyTest, which you can run. So in the folder, in the project I've, I've given you, uh, you'll see it, there's a script called run.py. So let me run a run.py. So run.py is a, a script I've written to make things a little bit easier for you guys. So it allows you to uh, download the data set, train the model, test it, run all the unit tests, run the coverage. So I'm just going to uh, run the coverage here. When you run it, what you'll see, so 
one of my unit tests is failing, so I think that's one of the, the things from before. But what you see here in this output is um, between uh, those lines, so 54, 205, you know, I don't have any test. Uh, so actually, we're doing quite poorly in, in this scenario, right? So this is the output, and the missing lines, this is where you want to make sure you look into and write some unit tests to cover those paths that um, are not picked up by the coverage. Okay. Now, test coverage is typically part of your continuous integration process. You know, you get push, and then before it goes to deployment, so continuous deployment is the idea that when all the tests pass and everyone's happy, psh, it's pushed to production, you might want to have a threshold here in terms of how much coverage you've got before it's automatically deployed. Right? So that's typically uh, what happens uh, in a real scenario. Cool. So there's a third exercise. There are four exercises in total. So the third exercise, what you'll see is um, I've got a test uh, that looks like that. And you need to refactor this test uh, to make use of the uh, given when then pattern and perhaps use better assertions. Okay? So let's look at uh, how a solution might look like. So you see things are more spaced out and documented so it's clear what the different steps are in my test. Awesome. So I'm doing okay on time actually, so that's pretty good. We can move on to the. Uh, the buzzword stuff. Yeah? Can I ask a question on something before we move on to the next question? Um, you mentioned separating the test the behavior from the implementation details. So, for example, x.r is the yep. R exists there. How, I don't see, well, how do you do that? Because if you, if you have to get at that variable, yeah. then you have to make an assumption. So, let me rephrase the, the question. So, um, in one of the, the examples, basically my test was depending on a field, right? And was checking the state of that field. Okay, cool. So that's what I mean by I'm coupled to an implementation details, because now I'm checking that my test is, um, what well, checking that the field has the right result, right? So a way to decouple yourself is to depend on a method, which is part of the API of your class. And this method might be actually calling the field. That's okay but the test never sees that. And the flexibility you get here is, if I need to make change to my class, rename the field, or go from a list to a set, the test never sees it, right? But it's the responsibility to the method to change, but at least there's only one place I need to change rather than two, okay? Cool. Uh, great, so let's take a look at uh, property-based testing. How do you feel about it? You feel good about it? Excellent. So um, let's, provide a bit of background between the two classes of uh, testing methodologies. So one is manual test, the other one is generative test. So the idea that tests are generated for you. Now, like everything, there's pros and cons. I'm not here to advocate follow one path. I'm here to provide you with the pros and cons and you make your own decisions on which one you want to adopt. But actually, I did find some bugs in my code using generative tests, so uh, we'll look into this. So manual test, uh, many pros. It's simple, it's easy to write. Uh, so the conceptual understanding here is quite simple. Even like a business person can look at your test and be like, okay, yeah, I agree. Uh, it's deterministic. It's gonna test the same thing every time because there's one specific input that you're testing for and one specific output and they are fast. And speed actually, it's really important, right? In a real project, you'll have hundreds and hundreds of tests, you get pushed, you don't wanna be sitting around for several minutes uh, to get some diagnostic. You want to know now, can I fix it? What's wrong, right? You've got some momentum, some pace, you wanna keep going. So that's what manual tests are so good and, and popular. Now, there's a big downside. So at the beginning of my tutorial, I was saying, you know, at the end of the day, the whole reason what we're embarking on a testing journey is to build confidence that things are functionally correct before we push to production. Now, if I write a test that checks an input of two and the integer space is almost infinite, right? So it's not infinite, it's either 32 bits or 64 bits, right? But we only 
checking one tiny little point into a much bigger uh, search space. Right? So actually, although you, you, you build in confidence, we're not actually checking for everything. That's just the reality right, of manual test. Now, generative test has a big pro, is that because we're generating multiple tests in a certain space, we're ch actually checking more things. So that's just the basic intuition. The more things we check, then the more confidence we get. Um, but there's many cons. So one is uh, a lot harder to write meaningful generative tests in comparison to manual test. And I'll show you some recipes and examples you can follow. Two, it's non-deterministic. We are generating inputs on the fly. So from one run to the other one, you might have different inputs that are generated. So it makes things less predictable. And three, it's much slower. And that's a normal intuition, right? Because you're generating more things as opposed to one case. So that's the, the landscape. Now I'm gonna dive into a generative uh, test. Now within generative test, there is another class called property-based testing. And the intuition here is that instead of providing a specific input with a specific output that we want to match, we provide a strategy for generating inputs together with a rule that we can check against. So a rule is different from an assertion that says this is the exact output that we want to check for. Here we're going to have to do things like, is this pandas data frame containing two columns? Is the shape of the input data frame the same as the output data frame? Right, so this is properties that we have to come up with, which are not related to an exact content. So that's like the big difference. And once you've got a strategy to generate inputs and those rules, then that's how you generate tests, essentially, because for every new input that is generated, we'll check that the rule matches. Okay. Here's an example of um, a property-based test using hypothesis. So hypothesis is a tool in Python to write property-based tests. So don't worry too much on syntax. I'll jump to a notebook in a second. But what you'll see in bold is a strategy. So the notation, the decorator given, comes from hypothesis. So what I'm saying is um, I want to generate pandas data frames. Hypothesis supports data frames in Pandas, so that's, that's good. And they're going to have exactly two columns. One is going to be called goal, and the types of the value are floats. The other one is going to be a static USD rate, so that's the name of the second column, and that's also going to be floats. So that's the strategy. And our hypothesis can go ahead and generate data frames with exactly two columns, with those exactly two names, but complete different float values. Okay. Now, when I write my test, you know, follow the given when then pattern, right? So, given a goal adjuster, then I'm going to apply a transformation of sample data frame. The sample data frame is generated by hypothesis using this recipe. Then we need to specify a rule. Now, this is where things get a little more complex because I don't know the output, right? I don't know the result. So, in this case, one of the things I can do is to check that the shape of the input and the output are the same, because that's part of my contract. In maths and in logic, typically they call this an invariant, right? That's something that always holds true. So my invariant here is that the shape are going to be the same. Now I'll show you some more useful invariants in just a minute, but I just want you to start understanding that actually it requires a different mindset, right? Suddenly you're not looking at inputs and exact output, you kind of have to think about properties that always hold true uh, in your code. So this part is called a strategy. And the good news is hypothesis has a really rich uh, vocabulary to specify strategies. So you can generate uh, JSON objects, for example, with different keys and values and attributes. They can be all nested. You can use different character sets. You can even have things that follow a specific regular expression. right? So that's all good stuff to create inputs that are uh, matching the real world. And then you have to come up with properties. So the art in property-based testing is the property, right? So what, what are good examples of properties? So um, let me first show you how to generate uh, strategies. Then I'll show you an example of running hypotheses. 
And then we'll um, talk about different patterns to write properties. So let's go in uh, the notebook again. So I've got hypotheses loaded in my notebook. And what I want to show you here is uh, what happens if I pick different strategies and compose them together. So first of all, I'm going to import uh, strategies to generate text and list in Python. So here's an example of what happens. So I want a list of uh, text. So this is two different strategies that I've composed together in hypotheses. And what you'll see is that hypotheses generate, you know, things that you might think about, like an empty list. That's an edge case. Uh, and a list with a single element, list with different Unicode characters, because that often makes things fail, right? So those are things that we don't really think about. You know, when we have a, a clean data set, typically things are looking good for us, right? But as soon as your model is served by uh, a service, you're gonna get some weird requests coming in. So a hypothesis potentially is a good way to, to test for that. Um, now, let's say I want to generate pandas data frame. So there's a pandas module. I'm gonna specify a strategy here that says, um, I want a data frame with two columns, the goal, the static USD rate, and they're both floats. So if I run this, what you'll see is uh, a data frame, it's got the two columns, different rows with different values, right? If I rerun this again, you know, I've got the empty data frame, um, you know, and different length and different size, right? Even some uh, uh, missing values too, right? Because that's okay. That's kind of what happens as well in pandas and when you, you load data. Cool. Um, now, let me show you one that's gonna be useful for my demo and for one of the exercises. So if you remember in the Kickstarter data set, there was JSON data. And that's a pain, like how do I write JSON data for my test? So now I'm gonna look at how to generate that on the fly. So I'm gonna load a dictionary strategy and hypothesis, so that helps me create dictionaries in Python. So dictionary, you know, key and values, and some text. What this line is doing here is to say, generate a dictionary that has exactly one key called slug, and the value is a text, okay? And then let's generate some examples. And this is some examples that are generated, so you can see the same key for the dictionary uh, occurs because that's slug, I've specified that. And then the values are different strings. They're all looking uh, interesting and weird, right? So empty string, just a double quote, some special characters, uh, and so on. Now, if you want strings to follow a specific recipe, a specific character set, or a specific format, you can do that too. There's a from regex strategy that generates uh, text based on a regular expression. So for example here, um, uh, let me just load that. You can see ah, 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 and then etc. right? So that's another way to, to create text. Now we can all bring it together. So what I'm gonna do now is to compose the dictionary strategy, the regular expression strategy, and convert all of that to JSON. So every strategy in hypothesis supports the map method, okay, which is a bit like the apply method in pandas, right? So you specify a transformation from an input to an output. So what I can do here is to say, I want a dictionary that has one key called data, the value is generated from a regex. Then the whole thing, I want to convert that to JSON. So I'm gonna map and provide json.dump. So json.dump is a function available in Python that will do the conversion to JSON and then generate the example. And what you'll see is that we get a string, which is a JSON string that follows this exact uh, recipe. Okay? So pretty powerful stuff. So now we have a, a rich way to create inputs that follow strategies. So that's part one. Part two is, let's look into the properties. So let me jump to um, the demo. So I'm gonna show you an example of running hypotheses, and then together, we'll uh, detect a bug uh, in my code using hypotheses, which I never thought about before. So that is a good example of where actually uh, was useful. So I've got my uh, strategy here. Uh, so we'll generate a pandas data frame, and I've got a simple assertion here uh, that's gonna check 
the, the shape of the input and output. I'm just gonna write another property here, which is uh, essentially gonna check that the adjusted goal that is generated is always greater than zero. Because we're dealing with uh, money here and, and funding, it doesn't make sense to raise negative money, okay? So somewhere my feature extraction, and they need to normalize that the result should be always greater than zero. And I'm gonna check if my code picked that stuff up, okay? So that's not the bug in my code, but it's like an example of something to, to think about. So um, let's run hypotheses. So hopefully that's gonna do it. Excellent, cool. So this is the output that you'll see from uh, hypotheses. And um, we'll see there's an assertion error and it failed for this scenario here. This is the falsifying example. So the goal hypothesis generated 1.0. For static USD rate, it generated a negative number. That's fine because my strategy was generated float, floating numbers. This is the sort of request that I might get over HTTP by a user. And the result was negative because obviously one times minus one is gonna be minus one, right? So this is an example of fa a failed property. So my transformer, perhaps here, there's different uh, options available, right? I know you decide actually, from an input point of view, we should have had a, a check already at that stage. So maybe a value error should be thrown at the input level or at the output level, we should normalize that if there is a negative output, it should be perhaps translated to zero, right? There's multiple uh, approaches to, to fixing uh, this code. But that's something that um, I, I didn't think about when I, write, I was writing this code. So um, let's talk about some properties and then I'll, uh, yeah, so I go through. So yep. run like 29 different examples, is that a configuration that you do to hypothesis? Excellent question. So yeah, you can configure a hypothesis on how many examples to generate. Uh, by default, I think I had 100 generated. So you can decide how many iteration it goes over. And that has a direct impact on the, the speed, essentially, of, uh, of running this process. Yep. And the good news also, if there is a, a failure for the next run, hypothesis picks up that uh, falsifying example as the first thing before it runs uh, the whole generation again. So strategies for generating inputs, as you can see, there's multiple things available uh, for collections, values, text, and so on. You can also build your own strategies. So there's an interface that you can implement. It might be a stateful strategy that on the fly generates value for you. So it's all really flexible. Um, so let's jump into rules. So how do we write rules that are actually uh, useful? That, that's where the art comes in. Now there are four classes of uh, rules that you can specify. So one is invariance. So that's something that always holds true. So like the shape of a data frame, the size of the collection, are all the values above a threshold. So like they're all positive, right? So all things that you can specify. That's not too difficult, right? Those are things that you, you can think about. Now there is another one that I personally found not so useful. It's called the uh, round trip. So I think that's a bit more convoluted uh, from a mathematical formal verification side, right? So it's like um, certain functions live together. So like uh, encode and decode, you expect the same result, right? So if I encode something to JSON and then I immediately decode it, I get the same result, right? So I could write a property that says when you encode and decode, you expect the same thing. So that becomes like your axiom. Now in, in real code that, that you write as a data scientist, I'm like, well, you know, the the, the scenarios where you're doing this sort of encoding and decoding and you write bespoke code to do this is kind of limited. So probably not as useful. Another example is reverse. If you reverse something twice, you get the same input, right? Now, I, I didn't find that many kind of real situations for that. However, things that are handy is the does not crash rule. So just simply saying this code here should never throw any exception in any circumstances, right? So here's an example that is conceptually simple. Max, max of an empty list. What's that supposed to do? 
<laughs> right? Like, wh wh what does it mean to have maximum of something? So you'll get a value error, right? So testing for the empty list scenario, that's something that you might not think about, right? So that's where the does not crash rule uh, comes in. Now, the most useful one, which I as a data scientist, is called the Oracle test. It comes with a big assumption. The assumption is you have uh, an implementation for an algorithm, feature extraction or parsing, which you know is 100% correct. That's the assumption, right? So that's why it's called an oracle. It's always right. Now, typically, it's common to have an interface with multiple implementation, right? So you could write a property-based test that checks a new implementation and the output with the oracle test. So that becomes your, your property, right? So the output of this new implementation is identical to this magic oracle. Now, if you have this oracle, then again, you get the benefit of, you know, test case generations and then you might find failure. Um, so, you know, like an example, sorting or parsing, there's so many ways on how you can sort and parse, right? Like in JSON, you have multiple implementation of decoding something from JSON. They all have different speeds and memory trade off. So that might act as an oracle, okay? So, um, Let's dive into a real situation, um, which I did not think about. So it's actually another exercise, which uh, we'll do together. Um, so this exercise, yeah, extract categories. Cool. So extract categories, if you remember, was this function that given uh, some input that looks like that, uh, music and rock, that needs to return music and then rock. Okay? Simple uh, exercise. So what I did was to write uh, a test with a strategy that generates, ooh, and to make it bit more complicated. This is not just a dictionary, it's actually a, a JSON string, okay? <laughs> so I wrote a test that generates JSON data and it's gonna check uh, an invariant. So how do we go about this? And then is there a certain situation that I didn't capture? So um, I've written the solution here for this, uh, this exercise, but hopefully you know, I'll, I'll walk through and everyone will understand it. So there's a strategy that creates a dictionary. This dictionary has one key called slug and is generated from a regular expression. Okay? So something that has a slash that separates out the two categories. And once we've got this dictionary, then we can uh, get a, a JSON string out of it. So far so good? Cool. So what's the invariant here? Well, the invariant is I'm expecting a, a list with the two categories generated. So I'm checking for the shape. So that's my invariant. So let's, uh, let's run this into a hypothesis. So I'm going to run it through the, the exercises. Ta -ta -da -da. Cool. We've got a failing scenario. What is the failing scenario? So the assertion failed because hypothesis generated something that somehow has a length of three when we expect two. So what is that scenario? Here's the falsifying example. You see it? The double slash. So if you have an input with a double slash and you split over that slash, you'll get a list with three elements. They're all empty strings. There's no way I could have thought about that, right? Like, I'm only human, right? Um, and, you know, in the situation where my service, you know, is offered to many users, yeah, I'm sure somebody will feed some input with a double slash, right? And perhaps down the line, that makes my whole code crash. So that's the issue. So now that I found that, I was like, well, okay, I can go back and improve the implementation of my code to uh, handle this scenario. And it turns out uh, there is an overload of split that takes an argument called a max split, which says you split at the first occurrence of this character, and then that's it. So. Now that I do that, I can go back and uh, rerun uh, the test, and now it's passed with 100 uh, uh, inputs that were generated by hypotheses. Okay? Yep. Five minutes. Five minutes. Oh, perfect. Bang on time. 
Uh, anyway, so hopefully um, you find that interesting. So, uh, and you know, talking to other people that end up using hypotheses after my tutorial, they actually found some bugs in real code as well. So it is a useful tool, right? But it comes this caveat that conceptually you need to think a little bit differently. And um, you know, it's about invariance and the Oracle test. Now a related topic is static type checking. So Python has a, a type checker called MyPy, which you can look into where you annotate the types of variables and arguments, uh, whether they're uh, integers, strings, and data frames, and so on. And then you'll get errors before you run your code. So that's also a property, but it's not really around the, the, the environment itself. It's around the, the type. Okay, So that's a nice tool to look into. And there's experimental support for NumPy that is being added into MyPy as well. So potentially, you know, you'll be able to say that a specific NumPy array has only uh, integers, for example. Okay, cool. So final topic, which I'll I'll go over uh, in more accelerated detail. So um, who knows who this person is? Huh? That's true. I was going to say Star Lord, but uh, <laughs> okay, that's another way to think about it. Uh, so you know. When you're about to do something really, really dangerous, you call a, a stuntman, like a double. The movie industry follows this tactic. Now, in code, we also deal with things that are really dangerous, where things can go wrong. Those are called system dependencies, right? Like databases or web APIs and cloud services. So the problem is, if your code depends on uh, such a dependency, how do you test it? So here's a process data function, and internally, it's going to call a cloud service or a database. So you have a, a dependency on that service now. If the service goes down, if it's incompatible, then your test is going to fail, right? So how do you get predictability that your code is in the right thing when you have a system dependency? Um, so that's the problem, right? So the dependency might not be available at the time of testing, or it might be really slow. So you have to get your coffee and come back, you know, something like that, right? XKCD style. Uh, it might return uh, unpredictable values that you don't have control of. And if the tests fail, it's hard at that point to know if it's the dependencies problem or it's actually the test itself that is wrong. So we don't know. So the solution is called a test double. And it's the idea that you replace that dependency with something that has the same interface, but which you can control. So it never actually calls a real thing. It's providing can result that you are feeding into it. So it's a way to say, you know this dependency here, whenever it's called, do I actually call it? We call it special double, right? So that's the concept of mocking and test double. Those two things are typically used uh, to mean the same thing. So there's multiple uh, libraries uh, that provides test doubles. Um, so for example, Moto provides uh, a testing library for Boto. So Boto allows you to call AWS services Right? So it provides the same interface, but doesn't actually call the services, so that's just for testing. Same thing for Flask and for Postgres SQL. So here's how it looks like. So let's say I've got a preprocessor. The preprocessor uh, calls uh, a DAO, so a domain access object. So that essentially calls a database and returns an object that matches your domain, so something like a customer, right? So what we're saying here is replace that dependency with a special mock. Whenever the load data function is called, this is the value I want you to return. Okay? So every time that's called, here's a default value. So we no longer have to make a real uh, call to that system dependency. So that gives you control. And now your test can focus on the main business logic rather than this uh, dependency. Now, as a result, what you might have to write is assertions that check that uh, certain behaviors are triggered. Right? So in this case, I still want to make sure that this load data function is actually called, right? That the code will actually trick it there, but I don't actually care about this function itself, right? It's been replaced. So there's lots of assertions available to verify interaction and behaviors. Here's a sample of them. I invite you to go through the magic mark uh, documentation to look at them to more detail. Um, so I think I'm gonna conclude here. So uh, hopefully you learned some useful things today and uh, you're feeling uh, pumped up about testing. So my name is Raoul again. Um, so Cambridge Spark, we do data science training and recruitment. 
check out educate.ai. It's a cool platform we've built that analyzes code written by data scientists in order to give them feedback on the code. Cool.